Can you hear me? Yeah, it seems like it's working. Wow, wonderful. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining this presentation. We will talk about a project that we have been running for, uh, well, it's approaching a year, uh, a group of affiliates that, collaborate, that are collaborating on in what we call the Heritage Guard Network. Uh, so this presentation for the upcoming, I think, 55 minutes will touch base on what the Heritage Guard Network is, what we are doing, and how you can join. Um, I'm joined by my fabulous colleagues from Wikimedia Poland, Wikimedia Ukraine, and Wikimedia Georgia. Do you just want to say your names very quickly? Natalia to the microphone. Hello, I'm Natalia Czwik uh, from Wikimedia Poland. Hi, everyone. My name is Ola Solkonyuk from Wikimedia Ukraine. Hello, everyone. I'm Mehman from Wikimedia Georgia. And I am Eric Luth from Wikimedia Sweden. Uh, so let's see if this clicker works as well. Um, do I need to do something for changing the slide? Otherwise, you can just enjoy the very beautiful graphics from from the from the visual team. Okay, then uh, you can change to the next slide if that's possible. There we go. So, so the presentation, as I mentioned very briefly, we'll do a brief introduction to what the Heritage Guard Network is all about. We'll share a few case study examples of how we have been working. Uh, a very brief intro also to the project timeline, uh, the working groups that constitute the core part to the project, and finally, as I mentioned, how you can join us. And with that, I think that you can change to the next slide, please. So to, to start with, the, the Heritage Net Guard Network is a seed project. That means that we have received funding from the Swedish Institute to uh, experiment, to try things out. The, the, the very focus is to, inno to innovate and try out new models. And we have focused to try to innovate and, and develop new models around how to use the Wikimedia platforms in order to safeguard and crowdsource uh, cultural and natural heritage in danger so that it can survive at least in a digital format. Um, the Swedish Institute is like uh, Alliance Française or like Goethe Institute or one of those kind of cultural institutes that I th think exist in, in many different countries and they typically support civil society collaboration, especially, especially when it's about um, collaborating across borders. So that's also why we have a great group of, of chapters with Wikimedia Georgia, Poland, Ukraine and Wikimedia Sweden. Um, the photo that you see on the slide is one example of where natural heritage has been in danger. It's from a forest fire that took place in a national park just outside of Sweden in, I think, the late 1990s. Uh, this photo was one of the finalists in the Wiki Loves Earth competition in, in Sweden and shows the, the disaster or the, the heavy impact of the fire on uh, the national park in Sweden. So if you go to this national park now, it's still like you see the, the burnt down remains rather than a beautiful flourishing forest. Uh, with that, I think that you can go to the next slide, please. And I will hand over to Alessia to... Uh, okay, so here in the picture, uh, you can see the ruined monument in Ukraine, uh, which was ruined actually by ongoing full-scale war, which is happening now in Ukraine. And this is a great example of why should we uh, protect uh, our heritage and um, actually because it can be ruined in any time. Uh, and so the main topics uh, also for research for us is the climate changes and uh, of course the war and in Ukraine as a case study example for that. Um. And the reason we uh, decided to cooperate uh, in this project was also to learn from each other. Um, we all need to diversify sources of revenue for our affiliates, uh, user groups, chapters. Uh, and uh, 
applying for external funding other than just Wikimedia Foundation is a great fundraising exercise, actually. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, Wikimedia Sweden, we had an opportunity to uh, cooperate for actually several months together uh, before applying for funding. And during those months, uh, we were trying to come up with ideas on how to prepare the, the actual application. Uh, and that was a very uh, intense, but also uh, skill sharing uh, process. Uh, and uh, we also wanted to explore hub collaboration. And uh, well, uh, apart from the partners that you saw at the beginning, uh, we are cooperating with, here with C Hub and Content Partnerships Hub, and they served uh, sort of uh, as sort of proxies uh, in the whole process. And it turned out that they have the capacity to um, combine resources, uh, and that's why we came together and um, decided to apply together for the funding. Next slide, please. Um, so how we work, uh, as Eric said, this is a seed project, which is a beautiful concept, meaning that uh, the funder, the Swedish Institute, gives us time to explore, to figure out if we want to uh, create the real heritage, uh, heritage Guard Network in the future in a more structured, systemic way. Uh, so this is funding for thinking. Uh, for figuring out, for exploring, for experimenting. And in order to do that and to come up with conclusions, we are working um, in four groups, and each partner is responsible for a different group, and that is one group takes care of uh, the topic of risks within the realm of heritage uh, safeguarding. The other, uh, led by Wikimedia Sweden, um, is interested in technology and content. Uh, and we will go into more into details about the group soon. Um, the group that is led by Wikimedia Poland um, is interested in how to engage people into the network. And um, Wikimedia Georgia is leading a legal and copyright group. And we will go into, into more details about uh, how we are working with the groups and what are the outcomes so far of our findings because we are in the middle of the project. So uh, this is just, you know, status quo um, for today. You can take to the next slide. The next slide, please. So as I think I mentioned previously before, we started this project l um, late in last year, in December, I think, when we actually got to know that we received the funding from the Swedish Institute. It was a happy day. Uh, just realized that also that means that we need to start to do the planning and carrying uh, uh, implementing the project as well, not only planning it. Um, we have had two physical meetings. So we met in Stockholm in February. Mechman complains that it was very snowy and, and cold and said that every, everything will be much better in Tbilisi. And in Tbilisi, it rained for five days. So I don't know. The <laughs> it didn't change too much for the better, the weather, I think. Um, but we have had two physical meetings to try to really get to the core. What does this project mean? I mean, it is an experimental and innovative thinking project, and Natalia called it. Like, so, so it's a lot about concept conceptualizing, meeting together, and, and figuring out how to do this together. How can we develop the best models for using the Wikimedia platforms that we all love for safeguarding and documenting cultural and natural heritage in danger? So we have had two of these phys physical meetings. We have also presented the outcome in a different occasions. We presented them at the UNESCO conference earlier in March or April, I think, uh, and also in other occasions. And all of the working groups that Antalya mentioned are up and running. We have had meetings with external partners for uh, since uh, earlier this spring and are working on the the, the working groups will lead to final papers that will eventually be presented at the final event that takes place in Poland in the beginning of November. Uh, and those working groups, like the, the, the meetings have meant that we have already started to working on also developing those final papers. Uh, and hopefully, I, I think it's like the, the work so far has been really exciting and we have a, really, a, a few really important insights from external partners. Uh, so I think that this final event will actually have a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, so say, stay tuned for more information about the final event in Poland in November. 
And then the project formally ends uh, 28th of February 2025, when we will also be able to apply for a much larger grant. So if we are successful and we can show that, you know, there is a sustainability, uh, like among our crazy thoughts, there is something tangible that we can actually start to develop, then we are eligible for a much larger amount of funding from the Swedish Institute. Uh, and this photo, uh, Mehman explained very well exactly w what it depicted, and I don't re ex re recall exactly what, but I think he has a microphone in his hand. Hello. Ah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, uh, in this picture you see the historic part of uh, Tbilisi and the harmony of the cultures, like there is Christian cultures uh, monument, Narikala, and uh, Muslim culture, uh, it's Moscow here, also near this there is synagogue, that's harmony of the culture which exists in Tbilisi, and it also shows us uh, like harmony between us between the, our partners, uh, like different culture, different mind, but we are working for same uh, goal. Thank you, Mehman. Uh, I think you can change to the next slide with that. And here you can see a few examples of the physical meetings that we have had in uh, during the last year. You can see how how sunny and beautiful it was here in the in the in the last um, image from Tbilisi. But we also met up in in Stockholm and had a beautiful, I think, a tour of the of the national archives in Stockholm to see like some really old documents about uh, Ukrainian heritage in in Sweden. Uh, I think the oldest manuscript was like from the 12th century or something like that. A really impressive old manuscript. Uh, Natalia looks very happy on the photo from the National Archives. Um, and we also had a beautiful, I think, tour of the National Parliamentary Library in Tbilisi. So we've also tried to use those physical meetings for also meeting with a few of the external partners that have a lot of important insights on in how to actually uh, safeguard the cultural and natural heritage. You can change to the next slide, please. Uh, and one of those four working groups that we have been talking about is the technology and content working group that is led by Wikimedia Sweden. And I know nothing about technology and content, so it's like my, my colleagues that do the most part of the actual heavy data and content work, but I'm trying to, to coordinate and talk with external partners on how we can actually make as good use of the Wikimedia platforms as possible when it comes to, to uh, safeguarding natural, natural and cultural heritage. Uh, I think you can change to the next slide. So we have, we have a few different questions we, that we are trying to answer through, throughout this uh, process. Like, what is the best way to actually use the Wikimedia platforms for crowdsourcing content on cultural and natural heritage in danger? We have the two very large photo competitions that all of you know about, Wikilove's Monuments and Wikilove's Earth. Can we improve those competitions? Like, how can we work with data? How can we work with partners to make sure that these get even more efficient? Um, can we use data in different ways to make sure that the data gets more um, searchable, findable? How can we make it as easy as possible for people to actually find the material that it, we have on, Wiki, on the Wikimedia platforms? As you all know, there's so much info on the Wikimedia platforms that sometimes it's a bit tricky to find. So are there ways of actually making it easier to, to search and find the content? And how can we collaborate with external partners to make sure that we get more content to the Wikimedia platforms, both data and content? Data so that we can improve the, the campaigns, the competitions even more, but also, of course, content, photos, to illustrate Wikipedia articles or data about where monuments exist and so on. Uh, so the, the, these are a few different questions that we are trying to explore through the technology and content uh, working group. And with that, you can change to the next slide, please. Uh, in, the, in the working group, which uh, combines a few different cultural heritage institutions, uh, mostly and a few researchers, we have had two, two virtual meetings now during the spring. And one of the things, one of the tangible things that we are already starting to work on is like how to develop guidelines on how to document cultural and natural heritage in danger. Like I myself, I know nothing about species and biology and, and nature and, and such things. So if I go to a national park, I have no idea what to take a photo of. And with, for example, Wikilove's Earth, we send lots and lots of volunteers to 
na natural reserves to protect the natural sites, and I assume that quite a few volunteers are in the same situation as I am. Can we get, develop guidelines? Can we make it easier for volunteers in one way or another to actually understand what 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 is special with this protected natural site? What what is it that I should focus on when I take a photo of this national park or whatever it might be, or when I go to a monument or a church or a synagogue or whatever it might be? Like, how do I how do I completely document this building? What aspects of the building do I need to focus on in order to make as good and coverage of this monument as possible. We know, for example, in 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 Sweden, the 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 um, uh, authorities have very few photographers to actually um, take official photos of monuments in Sweden. Instead, they rely on the photos of Wikimedia Commons. So what we do on the Wikimedia platforms is extremely important, not only for Wikipedia and our own platforms, but also how monuments are seen by external partners and thus also by a, a large general public. So can they help us to get better when we try to support volunteers in, in documenting cultural and natural heritage? These are a few of the different questions that we are trying to explore, maybe we won't be able to answer them, but at least we can start to explore them through this working group. And with that, you can change to the next slide, please. Um, and then it's time for a small quiz, because some something that um, Mehman will talk more about later is the, the how the lack of freedom of panorama makes it hard in very many parts of the world to actually document cultural heritage in danger. So we thought, what, what happens if we have no freedom of panorama, and then we just take away the monuments on the photos. Um, this is per like perfectly legal, I think, if you have um, no freedom of panorama legislation in your country because you don't see any monument. Uh, but it's also a pity to not see the monument because you don't really maybe realize where this thing is taking place. So we're having a few photos throughout this presentation where we just simply took away the monument from the image uh, and let you guess where this is in the world. So I don't know, maybe someone has a guess of what this Depicts. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Dubai. Um, yeah, it could, could, could be Dubai. I don't think this is Dubai, actually. This is another kind of uh, monument. Egypt? That's a, that's a, that's a better guess. Like something, he said Egypt, if you don't hear, like uh, without the microphone. It's something in Egypt. Pyramids? Pyramids. Yes, yeah, so if you change to the next slide. You see what the what the place looks like if you actually have the monuments in the image as well, uh, the Giza pyramids um, and the previous image, the desert around the Giza pyramids without the crucial part of the photo. So with that, you can change to the next slide, please, and I'll hand over to Natalia. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so the engagement uh, working group um, is there because we want to understand how to engage people in long term uh, to cooperate with us and to want to stay in the network. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when working on the application, uh, we were experimenting as well, and we downloaded to the professional version of ChatGPT the whole uh, manual and guidelines from the funder um, explaining to us what the Swedish Institute is willing to fund. And we asked uh, Chad to give us like the key words that are there. And the most common phrase that was used was sustainable network. Uh, so we understood that we have to figure out how to make the Heritage Guard network uh, long lasting. And since we are uh, cooperating with volunteers uh, and we already have quite a lot of experience here in Wikimedia on how to, um, how to make volunteers want to cooperate. Uh, we decided to explore this topic a little bit further within this working group. And hence, we are talking to uh, experts from different institutions um, and trying to also explore why other networks that we know, that we see that are successful, um, what what is their secret? Uh, what is exactly making people want to get engaged? Um, and the other key word is crowdsourcing, right? So uh, if we want to um, have, for example, newcomers, people that are new to Wikimedia, uh, join the network, then this engagement uh, factor is also super important. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so far we had four meetings uh, and uh, 
some of the meetings were organized with external experts that we invited intentionally, and some were organized because uh, experts came to us. Uh, a very important part of this project is communication. And this is one thing that we realized, uh, one of the takeaways from the project. Uh, communication is and should be like at least 40% of the whole work. Uh, because the more we can attract um, people from the outside, um, the more we can learn from them. Um, and uh, we've been talking to experts who, are, um, who have expertise on volunteer engagement, for social media, for example, um, people who deal with uh, conservation on a daily basis. And for example, we ask them, what is heritage in danger, according to you? Uh, and um, those that we in interviewed in Poland basically said that since the war uh, began, every heritage is in danger. The people who deal with conservation do not make any differences right away. Anything that is within the range of missiles is in danger. Um, so that only shows the importance of such initiatives. Um, and we were also contacted by uh, scholars, um, people from academia, uh, who uh, made very interesting research on um, how to engage people uh, through crowdsourcing after natural disasters and armed conflicts, for example, when something was damaged. And we are trying to understand how the thing looked like exactly. Um, people can bring, for example, pictures, non-professional pictures that they made um, to help conservators um, rebuild, for example, um, part of the heritage. And we are trying to be interdisciplinary as much as possible uh, and trying to understand this engagement thing from different angles. For example, we are trying to understand how uh, user experience design can contribute to engagement. So we believe that the findings, the final findings that we are going to present uh, at the conference in November will also give us some knowledge that is useful for Wikimedia as well. Um, so it is about variety of perspectives, uh, and even if we end up with more questions than, uh, than answers, that's also great. That's also what the funder uh, thinks is, is valuable. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I, I mentioned that communication is super important. That is why one of the persons um, uh, that we um, engage in the project is our communications manager, Yola, who helped to prepare uh, those pictures. And also this year, Wikimedia Poland started to cooperate with an external PR agency uh, who's help, helping us to figure out how to um, find support, more supporters uh, in terms of fundraising. And they showed us research telling that people are more willing to engage if they feel that something important might be missing soon, like something is going to uh, disappear. Um, so that is why these pictures help us uh, attract attention on the one hand, and on the second, uh, it's the most simple way to make people um, understand what the project is about, right? We don't want these, um, uh, this heritage to, to disappear. So here's another puzzle. Uh, what do you think is missing in this picture? The Eiffel Tower, yes, that was a simple one. <laughs> the next slide, please. Right, uh, all those pictures you can find on comments, of course. Um, and the next highlight, okay. My hand over to you, Alessia. So the risk working group um, is responsible for actually risks, risks which we are facing and which volunteers can face during their photography, for example. And that's what we are trying to figure out. So please, next slide. Uh, so we have also a few questions that we uh, um, need to understand with our experts. The first is to explore our potential difficulties and challenges with making content and data available and some security concerns for volunteers, photographers, and people who just taken pictures in the protected areas or just 
um, and monuments. Also identify and comply uh, information about existing cultural and also natural uh, heritage institutions um, and their data sets in the Baltic Sea region. And uh, yeah, this is the great start to create this network of the institutions and we already started to do so. And it can be very useful for the future and for the networking uh, in general. Um, and as well to explore the intersection between the cultural and natural heritage, especially the one in danger. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, so we had already four meetings with our working group. Here you can see some, some screenshot from them. Uh, and we engaged seven experts in our group, uh, which are Wikimedians and uh, people from some museums internationally, uh, and the people and experts uh, in Ukraine uh, as actually uh, Ukraine is a good example of the risks that uh, can be uh, can can be faced. Uh, so uh, the Ukrainian experts are really helpful in uh, in this because they can provide um, needed information. Uh, so the main focus for us right now is to uh, conduct an interviews with the experts and cultural and natural institutions in Ukraine and in the Baltic Sea region in internationally uh, to understand and to answer actually the questions that we have in right now. Of course, we, as Natalia mentioned, we understand that we cannot answer all the questions that we uh, have in this project, but... But of course, um, at least if you will have some base to this, that will be uh, really great. Uh, so we um, actually started to write uh, messages and inviting uh, cultural and natural institutions to join uh, this uh, questionnaire and to answer the questions. Yes, uh, uh, after it, uh, we will... Um, conduct a final paper and it will be a good like background for that uh, and as well please next slide one more question that and the main uh, almost the main one that we are trying to understand is the risks for vo for volunteers uh, so if you are a professional or just amateur volunteer or you have taken pictures for the uh, Wiki Loves Earth, Wiki Loves Monuments or in the protected areas, uh, we invite you to help us and uh, open this um, form. Uh, this QR code, you can find a short form. Um, if you want, you can join with uh, filling out the answers. Uh, there are sim simple answers, uh, simple questions, uh, and we're trying to understand what risk you face during your photography and um, actually uh, how it can be avoided. Uh, yes, next slide. So next uh, quiz with your suggestions. So what is missing here? Yeah, that's also was a simple. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yes. Thank you, Dan. And I'm giving my word to Mahman. Oh, thank you. So uh, you can have like uh, uh, all resources uh, and platform where you can share the resources. But sometimes countries' policies uh, can limit your uh, like ability to move these old resources to the Wikimedia platforms because Wikimedia use the free license policies and uh, countries, uh, like some countries, limit uh, like access to use uh, their resources or share these resources with everyone freely. Next slide, please. Uh, that's why uh, we decided to focus uh, on countries' laws. Uh, like uh, first in first stage, it's about uh, Georgia, Poland, Ukraine, and uh, Sweden, uh, and to understand what the current uh, status of these laws and how we can uh, like use these uh, resources in our platforms. Uh, that's why we uh, started to checking and uh, like uh, running the research uh, to understand uh, that uh, countries' policies in. Uh, these countries, and also check the freedom of panorama status. Unfortunately, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, many countries uh, limit the freedom of panorama. That's why we can't share, uh, especially new 
cultural heritage monuments from our country in uh, Wikimedia Commons. Uh, and we can just share the like uh, monuments from Middle Ages or uh, which is more than 70 years ago. Uh, and uh, well, uh, between our partners, uh, Poland uh, are like very lucky because there is freedom of panorama and can, you can share these uh, all uh, monuments and uh, image from the Poland on Wikimedia Commons. Uh, Sweden partly lucky because there is some issues, but uh, we'll share. You can read this uh, in our outcome document. And uh, Georgia and Ukraine is not lucky so much in this. Uh, and also we are uh, like checking the European Union directives, what's the status uh, in EU, uh, because there are some countries like France and Italy uh, who has no freedom of panorama and uh, like they're not agree uh, with uh, like, for example, countries like Germany to have a freedom of panorama between like in EU. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, our outcomes will be this, like uh, we can give you some suggestions how to run uh, policy research in your country. Uh, and also we will share with you uh, our like outcome from our uh, research, what we done and uh, how we can use this uh, for your purpose. And at the end, we give you practical recommendation uh, how to ca you can work with your government agencies or uh, your national parliament or uh, state to like um, change your like policies in your country and uh, like what the, uh, like positive language to talk with them and uh, give them some ideas how uh, it will be benefit for you, uh, like for the country, uh, to use this. And uh, yes, that's this. And next slide, please. Uh, well, uh, it looks like how you will see the photos on Wikimedia Commons if you don't have, for example, freedom of panorama or limited uh, like uh, policy in your country. And this is the hard one because I didn't get it what's uh, on this picture and maybe you can get it, but here. It's hard one, really. Yes, it's Stonehenge here. <laughs> yeah, uh, no worries because I didn't get it all. <laughs> God. No, here is not copyright, but for example, for new, uh, like in new um, cultural monuments, it's, uh, there is issue. For example, who visit the last year at Tbilisi and you see this uh, new charge, the, the biggest one, uh, I guess, in Caucasus, uh, Sameba, uh, you can't take a picture from this monument because it was built in 2004 and it's copyrighted. Uh, that's all issue here. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, uh, I'll hand over to Eric to close. Thanks, I, I hope that that gave some what of an overview of what we are currently focusing on doing in the Heritage Guard Network. And um, uh, the, the final part is of course that we want to invite more people to join the, the network. Uh, we have many questions. We have few answers, but we're trying to come up, coming up with few, with more answers. But I think that a lot of people in this room might have really clever answers to a few of the questions that we are asking ourselves, and also might want to get involved in the in the network ahead. Um, so uh, on the QR code to the uh, to the furthest left, you can see the main page of the Heritage Guard Network on uh, on uh, MetaWiki. And we also have a, a survey for volunteers that would like to join the, the network. So if you're interested, then you can take the, the QR code to the, to the right. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, and fill in information about what you're interested in and how you want to engage. And then we will reach out to you. Uh, we also want to make sure that we don't talk all the time, uh, but rather get potential questions and thoughts from your end. So I think that we might stop there. And if there's anyone that has a question or thought, comment in the room, then we're more than happy to hear. There's one there. Do you want to run with the microphone, Nachman? Thank you so much. Um, very uh, inspiring and congratulations for this initiative. Um, 
A few thoughts, and probably this is a question as well. Uh, first to mention that there is an expert group on digitalization of cultural heritage, heritage expert group to the European Commission that is working on a very interesting projects uh, like Twinet, uh, which is related to 3D digitalization. Uh, and the, this work of the, this group is related to one resolution from 2021, which to me corresponds with part of your goals because it is expected for all countries, all member states, to have a methodology to distinguish between three types of uh, objects, of cultural heritage objects, endangered, like it is uh, in the case, it is always like in the case with, with Ukraine, for example, uh, those that are very popular and those that are under digitized. So I was thinking that this could be a shared effort or it is, could be something that you can take a ready on for uh, this, uh, th those that are excellent in doing this methodology work. In, I'm representing here Bulgaria and unfortunately we are with a very bad assessment on this level, but probably there are some good examples. And the other question from my experience uh, related to the work with cultural heritage uh, is related to Wikidata. And if there is uh, some new approach in your work to datification of cultural heritage. So it is not only about the, the object as a whole, but for example, some specific parts of it or materials or other things that needs to be well thought. Um, so to, be, to, to, to create these data items, uh, the way that could then uh, make it possible to combine this data, to filter this data, and allow new, uh, new, new type of research on cultural heritage. Thank you. Yeah, hello, my, my name is Martin. Uh, 13 years ago, I started the Semantic Media Wiki project, which also targeted uh, collecting the information about uh, buildings. Um, <clears throat> and uh, of course, you can feel free to get some ideas from that project. And uh, <clears throat> from this project, I saw that um, only few peoples officially are under uh, buildings officially are under national heritage, and there there is a big gap of things that are of interest that are not officially have an official national heritage uh, status, uh, status. So my question also was, like, uh, I think you're basically targeting everything, not only what the state considers it as heritage. Thanks, yeah, I think that's a few really great points. And if, if you want to add anything, uh, Natalia, Olesia, Mehman, feel, feel free. I like to start with it would be really interesting to hear exactly like the name of the of the of the group so maybe we can touch base on that afterwards because obviously we're not the only ones in the world that focus on these areas um we're focusing on these areas like in our countries and then trying to to scale it but we like all the time come across like new partners new external organizations that do similar work and i think that's crucial because like they might lack the knowledge about with the wikimedia platforms especially uh, but have in-depth knowledge about how to work with cultural and natural heritage and we might lack knowledge about how to work with natural and cultural heritage but we do know how to work with the wikimedia platform so more more than happy to to get those names uh, and I, I also really Happy to hear like the thoughts about like data, not only about like the the institutions or well, but but also the the items and the content. Like something that we're thinking a lot about is, for example, it, we have really good data in Sweden from the Envi Environmental Pro Protection Agency. We have had like shape files that we had, uh, have uploaded to Wikimedia Commons. So you can turn it into a like a map, and you can you can see on the map like how to how to go go to a natural reserve, like all the whatever four thousand that exists or. Or whatever, but when you get to that natural natural reserve, like, what should you take a photo of? Like, it's really difficult. And like, can we combine this with data? What is the species that are endangered in this natural reserve? Like, can we can we combine those two different data sets into you know something that would make it easier for a volunteer to understand like how to actually document not only like one random tree in the na natural reserve, but this specific species, this bug or this bird or this uh, whatever it might be that is, or this uh, plant of some sort that is that is endangered, then I think that makes it much easier for Wikimedians to do our work, which also makes it more beneficial for for like for the larger general public and for the expert partners that want to reuse our work in the next step. So I think that's... Um, that's also something that we would like to explore 
further? Like it's it's a difficult question, like how to do how to com combine data sets in a good way. So any thoughts on that? I think that would be really really uh, welcome. And finally, I, th I think it's like super tricky question, like with the data sets that you get from the from the state, because the like they will have left things out or they, there's like they, they are never fully comprehensive. I don't know if you have examples from from Georgia, Ukraine, or or, or um, uh, Poland, but we also have like. You know, in, in Sweden, it's a big country and the state has been maybe less present in the far north. So the, there's people reaching out to say, hey, we have so much cultural heritage in, 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 like in, the, in the far north that the state has never been interested in, in covering. So how, how can we make sure to like not only cover the official monuments, but also the unofficial ones? But the problem is, of course, that from who do we get the data sets on the unofficial mm -hmm. documents? So I think that requires us to also find even other partners? Can we work in Sweden with the Sami, uh, like indigenous uh, population that might have other knowledge? Or can we work with, you know, local rural communities that might have, but then how do we kind of develop a good methodology for for adding this to, to Wikidata in a structured... Yeah, there is a, lo a lot of complexities, but I think it's a really important question as well. Yeah, I just want to add that we just started, like uh, we are just exploring. And uh, now we are like doing everything in very formally, like, uh, for example, data sets, we are relying on the country's data sets, what they have. But of course, uh, at the end of the project, we'll expand this list and not just rely to the country's official data sets, but uh, we'll check the municipalities on like local level, what they have, maybe they have more than country's data sets, and we'll develop this project. Any questions? Yeah, and the freedom of panorama problem. Have you also tried to get permissions from architects? Well, uh, it's very difficult. First, you need to find the dirt architecture. Also, um, there is hundreds or thousands of the objects in the, like in our country. I, I'm talking about Georgia. And sometimes the architecture is not Georgian at all. Uh, there are foreigners. And if you we, uh, like if we start to like pair the monuments, find the architecture and they ask them to permission, it's um, like it's big work. And uh, we didn't achieve, I guess, in sometimes we didn't achieve the like our goal and it's difficult and uh, like Wikimedia Georgia is not big organiz organization and affiliates and just with the free staff members you can't do like anything and it's uh, not can't done by the just volunteer Wikipedians you can't ask the volunteer to find the architecture of the object and ask them permission that uh, uh, Mikola Nikkei Wikilabs Monuments Ukraine. So we did try to do something like that about getting permissions from architects. First, it's very difficult to find like who the architect is for some places. For like famous monuments, it's relatively feasible, but there is like a correlation between how the monument is feasible and how much the architect is unwilling to give permission. For example, like the most famous statue in Kyiv, its architect like deliberately tried to sue people for not publishing for for like using the pictures of the monument so there is like some correlation on this one of course there is a problem of identity like we did succeed with some like not very commercializable monuments so for example we got permission for the presidential administration building because somebody knew somebody who knew like son of the architect but then if you go to like 1950s monuments good luck finding the like grandchild of the architect who lives like somewhere abroad for like years and probably does not remember that he still can give permissions for a monument which was like just copyright expired like only 40 years ago or something like that so it's like something where it's interesting to know if there is like some good experience in the movement of somebody who successfully has set up this getting permissions for monuments because we have tried we succeeded on like some cases, but it's like very hard to succeed at scale for like 10,000 monuments. So I'm interested if somebody had successful experiences also. 
And also, sometimes you need to find uh, them alive. Like if, uh, like they built in 1970s and the person is died, now you need to find someone from relatives or who receives this right after the architecture. For example, if you know uh, Zara Hadid, I guess I pronounced well, she died and she had many monuments. One of them is in Baku. Uh, and like, uh, she, I guess she gave the rights to the company and now you need to find a good lawyer or a good person who uh, take the responsibility to negotiate with that company to receive these rights. And I don't think that they, that they will do. At the end, it's always better to negotiate with the institutions to change the uh, legislation in order to allow freedom of panorama instead of uh, looking for the uh, authors of the monuments. I can share the Georgian experience here, like uh, we succeed with the Parliament Commission to allow the freedom of panorama, but we stuck in different case because on Commons we have the map and uh, uh, like many of you know that uh, Georgian, some Georgian territories was occupied by Russia and in on Commons in this map uh, these territories showed in different colors and the Parliament people find this map and they're asking now um, like us to remove uh, this uh, map. Uh, or at least change the color of the map that will show that Georgian territory is one, like one piece. So we stuck here, and now we are waiting the elections in Georgia to change something. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I just have a question about Sarah Hadid because she used to work in huge architecture teams. So it was not only all her, um, it was a team who did the, the plans and also the constructions. Just wonder how that works with the panorama ride, if you have to ask the whole team or if it's the company, because also teams change. Um, yeah, just a question. Well, uh, I can't dig, uh, not dig in this uh, case because it's in Azerbaijan, this uh, like uh, architecture. But uh, we'll check this and uh, try to find how we can do it. I think it's like generally very difficult with combined work, like when, when there's works that are built by several people at the same time uh, altogether, uh, and especially if it's like done as an employee, it's like a very messy situation altogether that would require that you know as Azerbaijani uh, legislation, uh, and uh, yeah, so so that's why also it's good to have a freedom of panorama legislation uh, because it takes away all the complexity in the, in trying to find out how to do it correctly. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the legislation. As Wikimedia Deutschland, uh, some years ago, we teamed up with Mercedes-Benz and the car producers. Some of you might know the example already, uh, because the car producers want to have freedom of panorama for autonomous driving, and therefore we could create a very unlikely coalition. And uh, when Wikimedia and the car producers come to the German government, that's quite persuasive. And I just want to highlight that, that sometimes it's important to see who, who else has an interest in panorama freedom other than us. Um, for me, the question is a bit of like uh, why there's so much uh, focus on the freedom of panorama question because, again, the majority of this stuff that we are talking about, old heritage, is uh, maybe a hundred years ago already out of the freedom of panorama problem. And also like the same examples that were brought there, like only thing that actually has any freedom of panorama issue is Eiffel Tower, but this only only night with the lights. And even that image didn't depict that, so none of them actually has the problem. So, and especially if you go out to get the monuments and uh, even try to find additional things that actually could be potential future monuments or something that state does not have recognized yet, then mostly this is not really a problem. But uh, if you really want to document them, um, one of the things that we have done in Estonia is really this uh, heavy focus on rare photography, uh, to having like this kind of then and now comparisons. Uh, have you looked also more closely on those things? Do you want to speak on that, Mehman? 
Okay, no, I, I think that's a great point, and, and uh, Freedom of Panorama is the starting point and not the end point, so there's a series of other questions that will be considered as well. Like, obviously, the, 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 f the photos that you saw were the ones that where people could potentially, potentially recognize the objects, and that's maybe typical for older objects altogether, but there's a lot of objects that are, I'd consider cultural heritage, but which is still in, in copyright. But there's, I think, a few other really important questions that that's considered as well. Like, for example, the 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 copyright status of, of the material information that is produced by the states. Like in many countries, there's like there's, there's exceptions that you, you can reuse freely information and reports, uh, statements that are produced by the state. How does that look in different European countries? Is that something where we can learn from each other's and and push for being able to use more information from the state? Like, for example, the the shape files that I was talking about previously, that's considered in Sweden as a, a, a statement by the state and statements are by law exempt from copyright. That's something that is very helpful for us to advocate that this is public domain information and that in the end also helps us to do better Wikilove's Earth campaigns. So I think that it's like we're also trying to explore and that's also why I think why Mechman added the EU directives, like what room and flexibility is there in the EU directive for pushing for a legislation that is more uh, compatible with Wikimedia values and the opportunity to share uh, share information on cultural and natural heritage in danger, in danger on our platforms. Yeah, I just want to add, in some countries uh, we can not focus m like on film of the panorama because these countries have more stuff from the like old centuries or previous centuries, but in some countries there are many stuff from the like uh, this century or in 19th and uh, when you want to like just read write the article in Wikipedia and you don't know what to put on as a picture in which article or uh, the reader can't understand uh, what to, uh, about this article. So not just this. Any I suppose question? also if you have like further ideas of, of questions that we should explore or or push for, then we're more than happy to, to hear because it's like a it's messy international legislations that are sometimes hard to get a comprehensive overview over. Uh, like uh, Mehman uh, with a lawyer trying to make uh, like a, a a mapping or trying to understand like what does the situation actually look like, mm -hmm. and also like how how can like issues be by bypassed if there is like a, a, a law that restricts something is there something that we can use uh, in another way like in in italy where they receive a lot of permissions from the from the local governments in actually documenting the cultural heritage or are, are there other solutions for like to to navigate in the in a messy legislative environment Um, can you say something to France? Because um, I, um, I thought that I cannot take pictures there, but uh, there are a lot of pictures of uh, buildings and bridges uh, already on Commons. So I think if they took the picture, I can take it. What? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and um, what about um, pictures I took in uh, the former Soviet Union in the 1980s, for example? earlier <laughs> uh, well regarding the France uh, like uh, we need to check the uh, law of France what uh, law says for example uh, if you want to find on Wikimedia Commons uh, the like picture of the Sameba it's uh, the new church in Tbilisi you can find but as a panorama view because our uh, like uh, law says that uh, the object can't be the like Mm, the main object on the picture, but you can take the panorama and put on this image like not just the Sameba but our church too, and you are allowed to do that because it's not main object. Uh, maybe it's case for France too. Uh, and the second question is about uh, ah from USSR. Yeah. Um, uh, in Soviet Union, is that uh, like uh, um, uh, legally Russia is the, like uh, um, how would say um, he inherited the U uh, U like Soviet Union, and uh, Russia has a freedom of panorama, and uh, like partially uh, there is freedom of panorama, and that's why uh, we use like Wikimedia Commons use uh, to upload all 
uh, buildings picture to Wikimedia Commons, and we are saying that in Russia it's a lot, so it means uh, we can upload all image all the images from the Soviet Union to the Wikimedia Commons. Uh, well, I think we're pro like it says on the screen like a big uh, like uh, angry one minute and fifty seconds yeah. left. Because it just gets a bit maybe off topic, but they were mainly on the USSR part, it's or in the Baltics. A lot of those things actually were mass produced, so already like having that saying that this really is author's creation is very questionable anyway, but this really goes very specific to details, and often those things are actually very extensively already, information is collected to commons and in other Wikimedia systems, so actually have extensive information on that topic already in Wikimedia systems. At uh, Baltic countries, also the part of the USSR, so it belongs to Russia, not the Baltic countries, especially. Copyright, fine. Well, it's questionable. Uh, okay, we have one minute left. Uh, so just to close the session, thank you very much. I was uh, really inspired by the questions and the comments. Even though I put a stress on external experts that we are talking to, these are always the internal ones um, that have the most important expertise for this project. Because we have to remember that no matter how far we explore the topic, it's always about coming back to how it relates to Wikimedia. And uh, second important information, uh, the final conference in November is a hybrid event. Uh, so we will be spreading information soon. So for you are invited to come, but if you can't, you will be um, able to participate uh, online which I hope is a good information since you have so many questions. And the third thing, when we started to work on the project, it turned out that we could basically do just this because there is so much to explore. Uh, and once again, we will not answer all the questions because we have to finish in November. But the fact that there is so much discussion only gives us another argument to apply for further funding and to create the bigger network. And one of the important questions, and here we also need volunteers to figure this out, is how to organize this network. Uh, formal way, uh, from organizational point of view, uh, that is also very important. So once again, thank you, and please go to the website and, and just join us. Thank you. <laughs>